Hello, everyone, and welcome to the presentation of Premesh Lalu's book, Undoing Apartheid. I am Leticia Sapsai. I am based at the London School of Economics. Hello from London. And I welcome you all today as co-editor with Natalia Brizuela and Victoria Collis Butelesi of the Critical South book series published by Polity Books. We are truly delighted that Undoing Apartheid is now part of the collection of Critical South. This book series, whose aim is to publish the work of key scholars and intellectuals from the Global South, and in so doing, disturb the established Euro-American canon of critical theory, is one of the projects of the International Consortium for Critical Theory programs, which is supported by the Andrew Mellon Foundation and the Office of the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Berkeley. This conversation today, which belongs to a series of conversations presented by the International Consortium, is special because it is co-sponsored in this case <clears throat> by the Center for Humanities Research at the University of Western Cape, South Africa. This conversation will be moderated by Maritz Pam Biverdonka from the Center for Humanities Research, but before I introduce Maritz and give it over to him to introduce the author and the panelists, thank you all for being here today. I want to take the opportunity to especially thank Pramesh, not only for trust us with his work, but also for his sustained commitment to this project and the consortium and the very inception of the book series. Actually, this is how I met Pramesh. Pramesh. In fact, as we started working together to imagine what this project could be and what it should do in the first place. I want to thank as well, Brianna George, Patty Dunlap, and the whole team at UC Berkeley for all the work that they have done to set up and run this event today. So our moderator, Maritz Van Pieper-Tonka, who is Associate Professor and Research Manager at the Center of for Humanities Research at the University of Western Cape, is also the Principal Investigator of the National Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences Program on a practice of post-apartheid freedom. Among others, he also leads a project on renewing archives at the University of the Western Cape with Patricia Hayes, and another project on communicating the humanities with Professor Lalu. He is co-editor in chief for the International African Studies Journal, Africa Focus. And with this brief introduction to Moritz, I'll leave it to you to introduce the event. All the people are, with, are here with us today. Thank you all for being here and contributing to this conversation, which I'm sure it's going to be memorable. Thank you all and over to you, Maritz. Thank you, Letitia. Um, as Letitia said, I'm Maritz. Be before I introduce the, the panel, um, I just wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping. The chat function should be live for everybody. Um, we encourage you to use it and to communicate with each other um, through that space. If you have a question for Pramesh or the panel, we will ask you to please put it into the Q&A function. And then we will, we will go through those when it comes to the time for Q&A. The order for, for our uh, conversation will be that I, I will introduce uh, Pramesh Garth and Suming, and then um, Suming will start, Garth will speak. I'll add a few questions um, from Heidi and myself, and because Heidi was unfortunately not able to be here. And then we'll start answering the, start answering the question. Um, so without further ado, Pramesh Lalu, who probably needs very little introduction to many of you, um, is professor of history at the University of the Western Cape. 
and the founding director of the um, Center for Humanities Research. Pramesh has published widely in academic journals such as History and Theory, Kronos, Journal of Southern African Studies, Africa Focus, Journal of Higher Education in Africa, Current Writing, and the list goes on. His first book is uh, called The Deaths of Hintze, Post-Apartheid South Africa and the Shape of Recurring Pasts, in which he argues that a post-colonial critique of apartheid is necessary in order to forge a concept of apartheid that, remain, that allows us to properly formulate a deeper meaning of the post-apartheid. He is co-editor of Remains of the Social, Desiring the Post-Apartheid and Becoming UWC, and um, has been a board member of the Consortium of Humanities Centers and Institutes and the list of boards that Pramesh serves on is too long for me to go through in his bio. Um, he's also, um, his bio doesn't, his official bio doesn't list it, but he is also the um, director of a feature length documentary film that um, was screened at a number of festivals this year and obviously the author of Undoing Apartheid. Su Ming Tu is lecturer in political science and sociology and leads the environment development and sustainability and socioeconomic impact research clusters at the National University of Ireland, Galway. Her research and teaching promote knowledge and inquiry concerning different meanings of globalization and development and the contestation of those meanings along North South lines. It addresses the challenge of development after post-development and from the perspective of human rights. Her research engages with development theory and political economy of development with an emphasis on alternative approaches, including human development, human rights and sustainable development. Um, she's also the, uh, well, from 2019 to 2022, the principal investigator on IRC Coalesce Because Project, which is building collaborative approaches to university strategies against exclusion in Ireland and Africa, pedagogies, pedagogies for quality higher education and inclusive global citizenship. Um, and then our, our second discussant of Pramesh's book, Garth Stevens, is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for People Development and Culture at the University of the Witwatersrand. Prior to joining WITS in 2006, he lectured at the University of the Western Cape in the psychology department. At the beginning of his career, conducted research at the University of South Africa's Institute for Social and Health Sciences and worked as a researcher on the MRC UNISA co-directed co Crime, Violence and Injury Lead Program. A clinical psychologist by training, he's also a professor of psychology and currently serves as the president of the Psychological Society of South Africa. He is a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. His research interests include foci on race, racism, and related to social asymmetries, historical collective trauma and memory, and critical studies of violence. He was the co-lead researcher on the Apartheid Archive Project, examining experiences of racism during apartheid and their continuing effects in contemporary South Africa. He is also currently the co-lead research on the Violent State, States of Violence Project, which re-engages a theorization of violence in the contemporary world. Those are our panelists. I'm going to hand over to, to Su Ming now. Um, okay, just check. Um, how long do you think I should speak for Moritz? 10 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. 10 minutes okay. is fine. Okay. Um, okay, I'll try not to go ma too massively over. There's a lot to say about this. Um, really rich and challenging book, Undoing Apartheid, that um, Pramesh has written. It um, mostly delves into three theatrical works which are, were performed first at the coincidence of a rethinking of both Europe and South Africa with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of apartheid. And uh, the three works are adapted by William Kentridge, Jane Taylor, and the Handspring Puppet Company. And why these works? Um, to advance and defend the importance of theater in particular, but the arts and humanities and their role in reimagining politics and society. This very possibility of undoing apartheid, of unlearning. And the three works are Faustus in Africa, White Tech on the High Veld and Ubu in the Truth Commission. So these were performed at this kind of like uh, 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 
a, a moment which was like a cusp in terms of reimagining and you know like this Kai, kairos moment the right time to reimagine politics and all the way threaded through this work is Seamus Heaney the Irish poet northern Irish poet's um gift to Mandela of his uh translation and rendition of the cure at Troy which is the difficult but hopeful tale of this character Philoctetes but it, it's a story about warring and deeply divided societies and what they should do in order to be able to hope for something that is beyond the reproduction of the structure of divisions. So hope is, hope is more than simply optimism that things will work out well. Hope is a possibility and a commitment to a possibility that something is worth returning to in terms of a struggle, not giving up on it, even if it involves um, the bearing of painful wounds, there's this hope that painful wounds may be cured and the struggle returned to in a, in a new way that creates new avenues for hope to rhyme with history, rather than simply history rhyming with history. So in undoing apartheid, the hope is the hope of keeping open the possibility of transcending grand apartheid taking people and politics beyond the, 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 the reconstitution of apartheid as a structure via the innumerable forms that will be taken by the aftermath of apartheid, grand apartheid, which is petty apartheid. And if you can go beyond petty apartheid, the hope is that a further shore will be reached. So this is about rescripting a schema of apartheid as this double game, the grand apartheid that divides the geographical places and also the structure of thought, while petty apartheid replays and rescripts this thought in the micropolitics and through the micropolitics of the human senses and ability to perceive. And this, this legacy of apartheid is this collision course between feeling and thinking. So what Pramesh suggests in this book, while he doesn't force us to think it, he suggests, it's an incredibly suggestive book. Um, what he suggests is that theater, or even the dream of, of, of something that he calls a theatrocracy, is an essential element of what we need to have in order that we can unlearn which is an aesthetic education that relinks our democratic senses and perceptions and helps a public to rework its fateful scripts. So for the Trojan horse not to have a fateful script of continuous uh, re-performance of exhausting and endless war, the hope is that undoing must be possible. So the wound of Philoctetes, he is Philoctetes um, mythical figure who has got this wounded foot and he is he's uh, thrown onto this island by Odysseus because the people on the ship can't stand the smell of his rotten foot anymore. And he's abandoned even though he is this great warrior, this great archer. This, this wound stands in for some sort of political wound for which a cure is not ready to hand. So he sets this, Premish sets this in a moment of the, the, the Trojan horse massacre in the township uh, place of Athlone in 1985, which killed and wounded three kids in a massive act of betrayal by the, the security forces, the civil force of the Joint Operations Command of the South African Defense Force. And so these militia were hidden inside wooden crates like the Trojan horse, uh, in a in and hidden in this park truck, and 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 this this event is like Philoctetes' foot, the a wound that is poisoned and can't heal, and the memory then that keeps coming back of this repressed violence, which leads us to question whether we can hope for anything at all, whether there can be redemption. And this is what challenges the very possibility of going 
post apartheid. So yeah, I have a few questions for for Premish, which is about um, why Heaney, and also who or what stands in for the figure of Philip Titis, the one who stays true and can be leaned on by the by 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 the wounded. And you know how. How can this, he poses this question in the book, how can the stasis of this continuous reproduction of petty apartheid, how can it be overcome? You know, given that this specter of war that keeps this holding pattern uh, is always there, right? So people keep returning to the structure because they feel that the structure is, is all that is stopping all you know, chaos from breaking out again and again. So I guess that's, you know, what Premish is trying to do is a very complex book and rich. So it, it makes you breathe in and it fills you with joy um, reading about these things because it just, you, you just, your brain just wants to go for a walk and think. And it's really lovely. But yes, I want, so I want Premish to dwell a little bit on the Irish connections, not just, you know, because, I mean, because Irish people always do this, right? Um, and, uh, what besides you know this this the just the rhymes that happen right the I I had a, a moment I stopped in my tracks when I heard the name Athlone Athlone what I'm a I'm one hour drive away from Athlone right how how is this Athlone getting its name wait what you know this is Athlone is the center of Ireland it's literally the middle of Ireland right um how, how did this, this, this township place get this name of Athlone? And he, it gets it from, you know, the governor of South Africa, but before he was that, he was also the, the Prince of Connacht, right? He, he, he's the grandson of Queen Victoria and he's a German prince. So what, what is this? So anyway, so when you're reading all the, your brain just keeps going in all these sidebars because there are all these details that you really want to follow, right? These little, little juicy little trails that you 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 really want to but you have to go back to the story and Heaney is great for that and the use of Heaney is great for that because you keep thinking about the betrayed wounded abandoned mythic archer Philoctetes how he finally escapes his 10 years of exile on this island leaning on Neoptolemus and Neoptolemus the figure this cryptic figure also who has succeeded in facing his own truth and resisting doing what he was instructed to steal Philoctetes bow and trick him. And somehow the two of them go off into the sunset and they go back to Troy and they win the war and do all the things. And yeah, so you, you, you have right at the very end when you say, you know, they, that there's this hope, the rhyming, the little rhyming couplet when they take the just spoils and they sail at last out of the bad dream of the past. So it's not history and history rhyming anymore. It's hope and history. But hope can't live without history either. So this is where Ubu and the Trish, Truth Commission's crocodile, you know, you know, the documents are still in his belly, right? So I suppose I want to come back to the aesthetic education the outcome of theatrocracy, which is from revolt, a moment of education and learning. And you mentioned something called an interval. What is this interval? Uh, you know, this, I, I thought of Michael Oakeshook's ar argument about higher education because I'm thinking a lot about higher education. I also loved your essay in Critical Times about, you know, what it's for. Um, so what, what is this interval, this gift of the interval, like the gift of the cure at Troy? And I think it's something to do with what we think is higher in higher education and also what is educational in higher education uh, as that which is irreducible to instrumentalization, even the instrumentalism of the market and what democratic promises there are beyond that for the citizen to remake their polity. Um, yeah, so maybe I don't want to talk much more. Um, I just want to come back to the many Irish terms and cadences around this gift from Heaney to Mandela of the 
cure at Troy. And how I felt when I read this, you know, about this as someone who has been transplanted into Ireland, I'm a, a, a migrant and educationally displaced uh, a migrant of migrant parents of migrant parents of migrant parents who have sought to provide their never native children with some ground that, well, we now don't belong to it, but we can live and work. And that is in education itself. And of course, now in Connacht, not far from Athlone, an hour's drive from Athlone. So I guess this book and this multi time zone launch for me have brought back to me, in essence, some um, a real enjoyment of the brilliance of South African humanities and how this, this type of humanities that is very South African instantly travels and connects. And I really, really love the jazzy feeling also that you have in it, this lightness that you brought with, um, you know, improvisation and coordination the whiff of perfect timing that's also there with the mention of Abdullah Ibrahim and already I could hear the music um, and the duration that this improvisation gives us, the interval that, that gives to us. Um, in, 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 there are so many great moments of timing in your book and I really, really enjoyed that. So yeah, Maybe that's all. I don't know if I had enough questions to pose to you because I was more kind of having a, a conversation with myself almost and a conversation with your book. But certainly yeah, around asking what is a little bit more about why Heaney and the Irish connection and tell us a little bit more about that. And then something a little bit about the interval, the gift of the interval and, and, and what what the aesthetic education really is and what does it really provide. Fantastic, thank, thank you, Su, Su Ming. Um, I'm gonna pass the mic metaphorically, I guess, over to Gar. Thanks, uh, thanks Maritz. And uh, thanks Pramesh for asking me to participate in this launch. It, it was really a wonderful read. And congratulations to you again on the uh, on the publication of the book. Let me start by perhaps saying th that I think the book is absolutely expansive in its coverage, its erudite, in its articulation of a thesis that I think attempts to fill gaps in our understanding of the subject um, in a race social formation such as South Africa, and of course, draws from histories uh, and myths of antiquity to local histories, specifically, I think the Trojan Horse Massacre as, a, as, as one of the central motifs of the book to philosophy, psychology, political economy, you know, the moment of the TRC literature, and of course, the, the three theatrical works that Su Ming has, uh, has already referred to. So, um, you know, my reading of the book suggests that the thesis being advanced offers us a lens that extends beyond our understandings and critiques of the the kind of stock standard political economy of racial capitalism, to include the ways in which the everyday, the mundane, the quotidian, the minutiae of uh, petty apartheid infiltrated all aspects of the psychic life of the subject and suggests that this resulted in a certain paralysis, a stasis, or to kind of take a quote from your book, a movement at rest. To maintain what uh, Sigmund Freud referred to as a repetition compulsion of race and perhaps an inability to think and imagine a world beyond the frozen temporalities of grand apartheid, resulting in a seemingly intractable return to race thinking and violence in post-apartheid South Africa. In other words, a, a kind of inability to move beyond the grand architectures of apartheid, so to speak, and so creating a set of foreclosed futures. So of course, Primesh is, is, is making the distinction between mythic violence using Benjamin's term, for the ways in which forms of power are asserted over human beings as a, as a naturalized authority, as compared to the kinds of self-disciplinarity that are encoded into subjects through the mechanics of the everydayness of apartheid as epitomized in petty apartheid, not dissimilar to the Jim Crow laws and the impacts on subjects of the US, including elements of segregation and partitioning of learning and education, 
to pro prohibition on forms of intimacy, to the regulation of movement through spatial geographies, to the very nature of experiences in public spaces, beaches, restaurants, parks, ablution facilities, and so on. And I think it is in the intimacies of the everyday that design and creativity are, sub are subverted. And I, I suspect that that's what, the, what the, the thesis is really pointing to. Uh, but it's not only subverted, it's foreclosed and perverted in some ways to ensure that the subject of race social formations are in some ways also implicated in their very subjugation in an endless cycle of repetition compulsion, or to use a different uh, phrase from, from Freud, the return of the repressed always returning to the grand, the mythic, and never quite comprehending the impact of the everyday and its imprisoning effects that prevent us from seeing the possibilities of alternative futures. So psychoanalysis, and which is of course, you know, part of my home discipline, offers up some thoughts to comprehend how these grand architectures, as well as their mundane expressions, translate within the psychical realm. Lynn Layton has made the point that psychic configuration is not simply universal but that pervasive forms of trauma are themselves constitutive of a specific structuring of conflicts in the unconscious and the creation of certain neuroses that are organized around the historical contingencies of oppression. In other words, while mainstream psychoanalysis predominantly thinks about neurotic symptoms as emergent in the prohibitions related to our earliest relational experiences in kinship and our thwarted desires within families, it's also true that social and cultural prohibitions in context of oppression may be compulsively repeated as social norms and come to structure the very psyche itself. And I suspect that this is partly where the book um, you know, is segueing to. Of course, this is similar to, to Fanon's challenge in, uh, to Minoni's analysis of colonized subjects in Prospero and Caliban, which was of course premised on the critique that he was not attentive himself to the social and political structures that are part of psychic formation itself. So in the book, and I suspect in the context of the Trojan horse massacre that Primish references, uh, is perhaps the symbolically unseen Trojan horse that you are surfacing, a sleight of hand, if you will, a perpetual emphasis on mythic violence that's resulted in an illusion of the effects of the everyday on the race subject with the deployment of psychotechnics leaves this unmistakable wound that never quite yields. To be clear, I'm certainly not arguing that the deployment of psychotechnics was the only mode of subject formation, nor was it as systematically or intentionally deployed, even though it had evolved uh, systemically and self-reproduced over decades. Prior to 1922, for example, segregated and racialized subjects and forms of welfareism already existed, but it is in the 1922 Carnegie Commission report on the poor white problem where one sees the introduction of professionalized forms of segregated welfareism and the further developments of partition social life, opening up the fields of industrial psychology, psychometrics, social work, again, all written up by Wilcox, who uh, also emulated the Leipzig laboratory of Wilhelm Wundt at Stellenbosch University. And it was a pivotal intellectual mentor to Verwut, a key architect and proponent of apartheid, and of course, a psychologist himself. Psychotechnics therefore became integral to pre-apartheid and post-apartheid thinking as a political technology, but it did not emerge in a single discrete temporal moment in 1948. I think it's also important um, that one thinks about psychotechnics not only in a unidirectional uh, manner, because it is somewhat internally contradictory and inimical to the logics of racism of the 20th century that was premised on the political project of defining humans, non-humans, and less than human. So that the deployment of psychotechnics is part of a broader psych complex that Nicholas Rose and Michel Foucault speak about. So the creation and recognition of a psychological subject, in fact, presumes a certain humanity. You know, if you are considered to be black and non-human, the minute you insert a psychological interiority, of course, the problem is that you also surface the possibility of being human. And I raise this because this seems to me, Premesh, to be a site uh, of resistance to reclaim personhood. And is perhaps something that, uh, that you may want to comment on, because I do think it opens up a debate about the extent of agency and resistance that is possible. And that perhaps runs counter to the idea of a failed project of resistance and redefinition in the face of apartheid. Apartheid, of course, was the quintessential double bind 
that Gregory Bateson refers to in the 1950s, a set of conflicting and contradictory communications that are essentially irreconcilable, but that at its core is based on control without co coercion. So we see separate but equal authoritarianism, authoritarianism for the sake of peace and coexistence, partitioning for thriving and so on. And when you, you make the point that the students had in some way stumbled upon something quite pivotal in 1985, it seems to me that what they were really stumbling on was the double bind that was operant in education, an education system that was supposedly to allow for development, but was in fact a site to cultivate a generation predestined to the role of automate and conformists within a racialized social formation. But I do want to make the point that this was perhaps not the only moment in which this occurred. And I would suggest that there were early markers of this in 1976, as well as in 1980 and, 1990, and 1981. Um, and then of course, there were, there were, there were later developments. Uh, I suspect that the fallist movements of 2015 and 2016 had some elements of this as well. And I, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts about, about this. We should of course remember that the real drivers of student mobilization in 1985 was in fact the democratization of educational institutions, the demand for student representative councils, P, uh, you know, uh, PTSAs, parent teacher student associations, the removal of age limits and recurriculation. But this moment in 1985 and perhaps in each of the other historical moments as well that I've signaled were also sometimes overshadowed by larger sets of socio-political demands that ironically may have also had the effect of diluting the possibilities to rethink the role of education as a site for an imagined set of futures that was yet to unfold. Again, a return to the mythic, but with a potential loss of the possibilities of a deep reading and exploration of the everyday me mechanics of rationalization. To be sure, I'm not suggesting that these demands were ill-placed, but I think I do agree with you that they perhaps came at certain costs. So of course, this recursive loop towards race thinking is not only present in forms of social activism, but in many other contemporary debates about critical race theorizing. Habitual questions about the intractable paradox of much of race scholarship persists. On the one end, generating theoretical and political gains that ultimately contribute to the demise of the, the, the fallacy of race and its pernicious sequelae. But on the other hand, seemingly underwriting its very reproduction by theorizing it as much more embedded in and material to social life. What does seem apparent is that much of critical race scholarship and praxis never quite escapes the gravitational forces of its own internal contradictory political registers. People like Dmitri Erasmus, of course, have made this argument for a double politics around race, one that addresses both the lived consequences of being raced and its ephemeral and changing nature within the temporalities of history. But even here, I think that we have to be circumspect as the strands of non-racialism and anti-racism that emerged across the 20th century in South Africa, certainly in my view, do not amount to a zero sum game. Uh, you know, some have argued that it, it would invisibilize the true operations of racism. Because in fact, there were connections to specific left-leaning, anti-oppressive, anti-exploitative political and social movements that were indeed very productive. Black consciousness employed a mode of strategic essentialism as both a political and a discursive practice that acted to unify Blacks across racial boundaries, but was also premised on a metaphysics of Blackness and an active opposition to the effects of apartheid racism. And so perhaps this is again something that, uh, that you could you could think about commenting on the idea of thinking about race at the level of subjectivation uh, that is advanced in the book. I think that this finds resonances with a number of contemporary writers focusing on this in their work related to embodiment, affectivity, affect theory, the affect turn, the politics of emotion, the affected subject, etc. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm referring to affect as an extra verbal sensory experience that is different from feeling and emotion but is integ integrally connected to discourse, semiotics, memory, history, materiality, and that can be understood as part of a much more coherent, cogent, and rhizomic system of meaning-making that involve both individual and social dimensions of the subject. Elsewhere, uh, certainly I and others have reflected on, on some of this in post, in, you know, when we're thinking about the post-apartheid condition, uh, thinking about elements like nostalgia, as elements of mourning, melancholia, and grief related to the loss of an idealized past, 
People like Ross Truscott, uh, Jill Straker, have described the challenges and potentialities of a white racial melancholia. Uh, more recently, Wahbi Long engages with shame, envy, and impasse as affective dimensions of our recursive loops back into race and violence. Peace Kigua has illum illuminated the affective logics associated with gender-based violence. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Jacob Dlamini's work, uh, where he suggests a more nuanced account of subjects under apartheid and the importance of recovering multiple facets of these subjects through recognizing both their subjugation, but also their everyday experiences of pleasure, enjoyment, love, and so on. And of course, Abbas talks about an affective politics of disappointment that we have to engage with as one way to avoid such a recursive outcome. But Primesh, I think, and, and I know that uh, I, I need to kind of draw to an end, I think that you, of course, taking this further to make the argument for an aesthetic education to address precisely the effects of psychic representations of racialization for centuries on subject formation and to offset the sequestered components of uh, psychic life within context of protracted historical authoritarianism and partitioning. And by aesthetic education, and this is not my field, but I am of course assuming the cultivation of creativity and imagination, the avoidance of the collapse of thinking and the expression of alternative forms and futures and of course, you illustrate this potential through the three exemplars of theatrical works that uh, Su Ming's already mentioned. So while not my direct area of disciplinary expertise, and perhaps I will draw to a close here, I did wonder about the possibilities and the impossibilities of an aesthetic education that you may want to share your thoughts on, especially in a world where there is the proliferation of new technologies. And how these technologies, in fact, are objects that, that, that are, are mediating objects that can offer both a site for resisting or reproducing race thinking, especially given the kinds of compulsions that one sees towards a self-curated subject within, for example, the social media space, and in an epoch of a differently constituted mass communication terrain as compared to that of the 20th century, where we see the emergence of the quintessential self-referencing atomized, deterritorialized neoliberal subject. Moreover, in the context of ongoing and new forms of political economy of race that have in fact increased levels of inequality in a country like South Africa, frequently still across racial cleavages, fractures and axes, what are the kinds of possibilities and impossibilities of connecting an aesthetic education to a crit critique of and a resistance to such an ever morphing political economy of race. So let me end with some of my initial thoughts there. I think, I hope I've suggested a number of questions for you to, to kind of ponder on and respond to uh, Premish. But just to say it was a wonderfully provocative and fascinating read. Um, I have to say that there were times when I had to go over it several times in some places just to kind of get a sense of what you were really trying to put across there. But thank you so much for opening up a space for this conversation, which I think is really, really needed uh, in South Africa at this moment. So thank you. Thank you, Garth. That's, that's a fantastic set of comments from, from you and Su Ming. I, I want to remind all the participants, all the attendees, I guess you're called, um, that um, if you have questions, please uh, type them and post them in the Q&A, um, not in the, uh, in the chat. So we're going to be monitoring the Q&A for answering questions, not the chat for answering questions. Um, be, while Pramesh thinks of a few answers to those very astute readings of, of his book. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of questions that, that Heidi sent and that I've pulled together as well. So Pramesh, from, from Heidi, um, she says that she's interested in, in how the concept of the aesthetic develops, the, the, the concept of the aesthetic that Pramesh develops opens a Marxian understanding that engages the relationship between technology, race, labor, and capital, and the question of value in relation to the elided figure of the slave, and brings that to bear on a concept of the post-apartheid. In, in this concept of the aesthetics that Pramesh um, develops, and I think this ties into what, what Garth was asking as well, actually, um, 
aesthetics moves away from Rancia's sense of aesthetics and politics and moves towards a Spivakian aesthetic education. So she would suggest that you could speak towards what you mean by aesthetic education in your in your book and how it makes marks that um, interaction. The second the second thing that she wanted to raise is around um, the collusion between science and empire that you mark, and the way that that you you trace it uh, doesn't your your tracing of it does not hinge on a critique of scientificity. That's a word, but rather on the occluded political project and its blindness to a reflective ethics that leaves it vulnerable to conscription. So, in other words, it's that your book is not critical of science, but critical to the blindness that allows it to be conscripted in the interests of empire. And if you could um, speak a little bit to that, I have a question to throw in as well. Um, so we, we we've had from both Suming and from Garth have mentioned the, um, you know, the grand apartheid, petty apartheid distinction that you track through the book. Um, when I was reading, reading your book, I noticed uh, an additional um, dyad, which is apartheid under apartheid, and under in the sense of under the sign of apartheid, which seems to, um, which seems to uh, connect into uh, you know, what signal when you refer in quite a few moments through the text to Derrida's racism's last word. Um, so this reverberates, of course, into the grand versus petty distinction. There seems to be something about under apartheid that is approached through techne and not technology. Mm. And so, what, so to ask you to speak a bit more to that. I've got two other questions, but I'll come to them depending on um, what happens during the course of the chat. So Pramesh, over to you. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Suming and Garth. Those were, you know, stunningly beautiful readings of a text that I've been very anxious about. Uh, partly because I keep thinking, in a way, is it's kind of holding point, if you like. Uh, so thank you very much for pointing out some of the uh, ways in which one might work through this text, and it is offered in some sense as a text, uh, you know, that has um, this formulation that uh, Tim Campbell put. Uh, put, gave to us a few years ago at the Center for Humanities Research called, uh, you know, uh, his book is titled Cinema as a Generous Form of Life. And I've been thinking about the humanities as a generous form of life. Um, so I've, I've been trying to be as, as, you know, I come out of a fairly polemical tradition, uh, Garth will know this, uh, and trying to unlearn my, my uh, habits of polemic and trying to work with, um, you know, putting together um, through this term consilience of inductions, which I get out of physics, a new way of thinking humanistic kind of uh, endeavor and the terms on which we think and speak to each other. So, so this is wonderful to hear you both, um, you know, uh, give me a sense of what this book is, is capable of in, in that respect. Uh, Moritz, I, I thank you for those questions. And I also want to thank Leticia, Victoria, Thomas and uh, um, Natalia uh, for seeing this book through the polity process and through the series, um, it's been a wonderful opportunity to work with, with, with colleagues. Um, I'm going to start, you know, there's so many ins and outs of this uh, in the questions that have given, uh, been given to me, but I'm going to, you know, I want to take up the question that Moritz posed and work my way through uh, some of the, the others. And that's really uh, the move that the book makes tactically to try and hold techne and technology at a little bit of a remove. And so, you know, there's been an ongoing sense in which there's a subsumption of the question of techne, craft, making, the arts, uh, into technology. And I've been trying to say that as much as one has a, a kind of technology of power, that abuses its relation to a question of techne, there might be something else to do with the question of techne. So to keep them a little apart, uh, given that this is a book about apartheid, um, and to try and figure out a different relationship between techne and technology. Now, the question here is really what Tzu Ming was pointing to, the question of Ireland. And, you know, some of you might know, I went to Ireland on a fellowship. I was completely exhausted at the Center for Humanities Research. My colleagues gave me some time out to go and, and work on this book. And 
when I encountered, you know, the Seamus Heaney Museum, sort of generosity of Jane Almeyer and other colleagues at the Humanities Hub, the E. Patton and others, I realized that there was something in the pure Troy that was alerting me to a, a way of working against these forms of partition that had taken hold, not only in, in Ireland, but also elsewhere in the world. It's a political rationality that takes hold after the Second World War. And it is interesting in all the ways we've come to think about the present and its political, uh, its political kind of naming, in all the arguments about decolonization and so on and so forth, none of which I'm necessarily opposed to, we have dropped the word partition from our vocabulary. And it does seem to me that that political rationality is something that one encounters very, very pertinently in these state formations that took hold after the Second World War. Apartheid in 1948, I mean, Ireland a little bit earlier, but I mean, one thinks about India, uh, Pakistan, um, you know, the Middle East is, 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 is uh, kind of continues to be a site where the question of partition, you know, haunts us and so on and so forth. So I am interested in what partition does then. The question really that I was trying to pose in thinking about apartheid is why we hear the word segregation when we hear the word apartheid. Because Foote in some sense was, you know, in his visit to the US in the 1920s, making the argument that integration had failed and apartheid was therefore called into being as a kind of conceptual force. Um, as a result of that, you know, inability to kind of think about integration in the American South as the model for um, the post-slavery world. And his argument really is in relation to a Gestalt formation that had taken hold in Leipzig and in which he had been schooled, both at Stellenbosch University, but also when he went to Leipzig. And so what I hear in the word apartheid is the word parts. And it's the rule of parts that comes to presuppose, you know, a relationship to the rule of whole. So this is the debate on Gestalt in, Germany, in Berlin and Leipzig that gets worked out as a political rationality by the 1940s in 1948 in South Africa. But I'm basically wanting us to rethink the problematic of race specific to apartheid. And that apartheid reveals something to us that we might want to think about more systematically and more carefully in a kind of in a global frame. And you know, this was a question that had arisen in the center. None of these are, are questions that haven't addressed something or the other that have that has emerged in the in the center. Uh, Moritz and Cesare Casarino taught a, cl a class on global apartheid. And the argument there was about, you know, apartheid was global to begin with, which is something I felt was both provocative, but also um, inadequate for the problem that I thought we were, we were engaged with. So the question here is, how do you rethink the problematic of, of race? And part of this project is to ask us to think carefully about its relation to the question of technology. Because it seems to me in all the kind of ways that Garth, you know, articulated precedents for the struggles of the 1980s, what slipped out of in each of those articulations of the problem of apartheid was the question of technology. So we never thought about apartheid as a technology of power, for example, you know, and yet it was deeply marked by, you know, the post-cybernetic world that had come into being in the same year that apartheid was declared a political project of a state uh, in a place called South Africa. And so, so I'm saying that apartheid in some sense was an endpoint of a political rationality that had garnered, that had used race as a speculative currency, that had shifted race from one technical system to another and came to reside in a problem uh, in South Africa uh, called apartheid. So that's the one thing about why Ireland was so intriguing to me, was the question that we share, but not in common. And that's the question of partition and why partition more than colonialism, which is a subject that I took up in the first book, in the deaths of Hinsa, that apartheid, the, the, you know, and this has been a long-standing uh, effort in South Africa. You think about Harold Walpi and all of these Marxist scholars who were trying to connect apartheid and colonialism and that famous formulation that doesn't work called colonialism of a special type. And in this book, the premise is the slave. 
the abolition of slavery in 1834 and the scientific revolution that unfolds alongside that, that produces another configuration in the co-evolution of the human and technology. And I'm suggesting that over 200 years, there's been an unfolding of that co-evolutionary co relationship between the human and technology in which race has become a particular kind of ground from which to articulate power and, and, and so on. So just to say that I'm, you know, I'm not convinced that there, there's only one theorization of the everyday, we know that. Um, and the everyday that, you know, I respect a lot of the work, like at Lamini's work, wonderful native nostalgia is an incredibly important uh, text that, you know, inspired me to think very carefully about which form of the everyday is important in the argument that I'm trying to make. And I think it was Heidi Grunebaum's work, um, the first book uh, that, you know, also gave rise to a project in the center called War in the Everyday, that allowed me to think a little bit about the everyday through, you know, the question of psychopathologies. And in thinking this question, what I want to suggest is that there's a way in which psychic subjectivity or psychic life is transferred to the orders of biopolitics, where biopolitics is tilted towards technological modes of being or existence. I'm really, you know, in a moment of deep frustration, and you know, I work at a historically black university, UWC, Goth was a, was, a uh, was a student at some point at UWC, a colleague at UWC, and knows how difficult it, mean, it is to exit the scripts that are given to you. I mean, they, they, there's almost a way in which, you know, one is within these, within the circular causalities, you know. Um, so, so I'm really thinking from within this institutional space, from within the kind of problematic of Athlone, uh, which is where I schooled and I was part of the student movement in 85, and asking what would have happened in that debate on liberation and education, if we had asked ourselves whether education might offer us a different perspective on the problem that we were dealing with. And I'm suggesting that it has a completely different temporality to the urgencies and expediencies of, the, of, the street, of street fighting. And that it requires, you know, and the book performs a certain educational function, if you like, of posing that question back to that generation of 1985. Um, I hope I'm getting to some of the areas that were, 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 were kind of pointed to. Um, you know, the, uh, the question of aesthetic education, you, Moritz, you're right, it is, you know, gesturing towards Spivak's uh, work. Um, but I want to think a little more carefully about what it means to have a project of sensory training in an institutional space of the university. And the reason I'm saying this is that I've only now recently discovered for Wood's relation to the sensory is an important moment. And, and Garth, you're absolutely right. There's a whole proliferation of a field in that moment in the 1920s. And intellectuals like S.M. Moleva, Silas Molema, who I write about in the second chapter, were deeply worried about the consequences of race out of those disciplinary formations. In other words, something was beginning to point out a future of race that looked horrifying to a student like Molema, who was a medical student in Scotland in the 19, in 1920. I, want, I think that in that same moment, it's fascinating in 1920, when Fervut, Molema, and also Hayek are being educated, that Hayek writes an essay on the sensory order, which becomes a critical text in 1952, under the same title, the sensory order. And the sensory order is the old text of neoliberalism, I'm convinced. It is not the, the stuff that came afterwards in the discussion on economics. It was actually the sensory order that was an unbelievably critical text in the formulations that we now come to know capaciously as neoliberalism. And I think there's something about tracking the unfolding in what I'm calling the co-evolution of the human and technology that points to how a psychic subject or psychic life is transferred to the realms of biopolitics and tilted towards mechanized forms of life. And the three plays give us three configurations. Each gives us eight configurations. 
In Faustus in Africa, you have the problem of immaterial labor. And we are now in a form of capital where immaterial labor is a question that we will have to deal with in very, very definite ways. I mean, I don't think we can elide this question any longer. You know? And I don't think that Hart and Negri are the only ways to think about the question of immaterial labor. But here again, immaterial labor is also what is the name given to the arts at the university, at the institutional site of the university. It's useless labor, you know, or, you know, it's entertainment. That's how the university thinks about it, you know. Outreach at best, entertainment at worst, right? Um, not at Witzgar, but, you know, many other universities. Um, I'm saying that we must recuperate something from the, from the realms of immaterial labor that would lend to a kind of undoing of apartheid. And in that sense, you know, that Faust chapter complicates our relation to the problem of immaterial labor through a reading of Marx's essay in the Grundrisch on machines. The second chapter on, uh, the, the chapter that follows on Wojciech, is a chapter about sensory evisceration. And the puppet is an unbelievably potent force in animating the realms of sensory evisceration. And I think what, what you're dealing with there is an ability to think about what a sensory education would look like, what it would mean to, to recuperate something from this despair that is, is projected onto the, onto the, uh, um, onto the, the subject. And then finally, of course, slapstick. And, and yeah, you know, I grew up with Charlie Chaplin and, you know, the cinema of Chaplin and others. And I was thinking that Ubu and the Truth Commission did much work with the idea of slapstick and what it might offer in a moment of, you know, where there's unrequited love in the story that, it, that is being told. But I want to both state the problem of race and technology and recuperate something from the realm of technology. Technology that would enable us to set about doing the work of, of undoing apartheid. And it is, undoing is a work of doing. And I want to here say that, you know, in most of the ways in which we think apartheid and the post-apartheid, we think about them as transcendental. You know, you're gonna transcend apartheid. And I'm suggesting no, one has to undo apartheid. And an aesthetic education is the principal force, I believe, that will enable us both to create some sense of inequality in education and also enable us to work at the level of the sensory to undo the effects and force of apartheid. I'm going to pause there. I know there are other questions, but I thought rather than me just you know go on and on about, you know, the I, I just wanted to say that they, I think there's a way in which one wants there's a very particular use of the concept of the everyday. There's a very particular reference that's unfolding in relation to DNA and technology. And I want to suggest that all of these are mobilized in the effort to rename the problem of race so that it doesn't become the source of a mythic violence, but that produces the conditions of reaching the further shore, which is the phrase that uh, Su Ming drew attention to from, from Seamus Heaney. Um, and it really is that further shore that is the question that partition brings to the fore. Partition raises the question of what it might mean to reach the further shore. Thank you, Pramesh. Um, I am going to let um, Suming and Garth, if you want to respond to Pramesh, if you want to have a, a response to his responses in a sense. I wanted to just flag, Pramesh, that you never answered uh, Suming's question on the gift of the interval. Um, may, may I take, uh, you know, so one of the, you know, the Trojan horse has, uh, massacre has occupied me for many, many years. I've, I've suffered this event because I, you know, I was, as part of that student movement, I've struggled to make sense of the, the event. I mean, the first book, the dissertation was titled In the Event of History. And it was trying to say, you know, we got to we got to stretch this idea of the event, you know, so that we we allow for some space to think. Um, and you know, in the world where we overrun with immediacies and urgencies, there is a sense in which one longs for a space to think, a different temporality in which one might 
reorganize one's thought. Um, in other words, you know, different modalities of time, Kronos, Kairos, you know, but also in Abdullah Ibrahim's sense, in a brother with a perfect timing, you know, competing temporalities that don't collide. And what we're finding is an intensification of the prospects of collision in which thought is becoming more and more or less and less possible. And I'm trying to think about that moment in Athlone. And yes, when I walked around I, uh, Dublin, I was absolutely amazed. One moment I was in Lansdowne and the next moment I was in Claremont and I couldn't believe it. You know, yeah, you couldn't walk from one suburb to the other, even though they share those names, but there it was just across the street, you know. So there's a wonderful way in which, you know, partition also has a, a limited horizon in naming, you know, um, that it kind of produces its own name everywhere. Um, but um, I wanted to say about um, uh, the interval. And in some sense, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Paul Verilieu's work, um, who has been very troubled when, I mean, he's now, I think he's passed away, if I'm not mistaken. But he, he has, he always put attention to the way there was an increase, a masochism of speed and a constriction of space in the contemporary conjuncture of capital. And I'm deeply, you know, worried about that symptom becoming the hallmark of how we organize the university's time. So just anecdotally, a few years ago, we had a visit by Caroline Powell's from uh, Fair University uh, in Brussels. And I asked her how they dealt with this demand for urgency and immediacy. And she said, well, it was quite easy. We, we organized the class for on slow thinking. And more than that, we invited the music department to teach it. And I think she said that she invited the cellist to teach the class because everyone will learn to fail. You can't learn to play the cello in one year. But I was intrigued by that you know, sense that the demand for education in that period, and it is Richard Reeves' novel, Emergency Continued, and the urgencies that emergency produces that created the sense of a desire to learn, a joy of learning, of, of being able to, it's not just making sense. And, and so assuming you're absolutely right, I'm, I'm for an education that refuses instrumentalization, but an education that allows us to orient ourselves to the world. And at the moment we're producing you know, deep, a deep sense of anxiety at the institutional site of the university. And we're looking at all sorts of things and the critique is often correct, but we produce the temporality that is leading to a deep worry about the psychic effects of this education. I think that, you know, it is connected to that psychotechnic moment, you know, um, and I know Erica Crestwell, uh, Fretwell has just written a book on psychotech, he calls it psychophysics in the US. And it's interesting that one of the big influences of Farouk was a guy called Hugo Munsterberg, who is a founding figure of both cinema studies as an in industrial technology and industrial psychology. So all of that to say the interval for me is something to, to orchestrate. And I'm not sure that you know we have we have aesthetic forms. The cinema is deeply dependent on. Uh, the interval. I mean, I'm thinking about Trinity Min Han's work, uh, there are a number of others uh, who have written on the cinematic interval. And I'm returning to Athlone, not only to the, the interval that was, that was possible there, but the places where the, the interval was possible, the cinema, jazz, you know, all of these orchestrations in the everyday. So I'll leave you with this comment, and it is in the book, that some years ago in an engagement with Abdullah Ibrahim, he said to me, he was fascinated. And you know, this is the everyday that I'm interested in, slip of the tongue, you know. Um, he, he said to me that he was fascinated that people in Athlone or in, on the Cape Flats never spoke of going to see a double feature. They always went to see a double future. And it was that, that you know, charged me to think about competing temporalities and why we might want to hold on to those competing temporalities, even when, as in the idiom of as, we want to arrive with perfect timing.
how can you even follow this kind of discourse? I don't know, <laughs> Moritz. Um, I think that, I mean, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, higher education and what is educational about it? And what is this, what is educational time? And I guess in critical theory, we don't often pay attention to educational philosophy, mm. which has very specific educationalness about it. And, and what it is, this time of education, which is a time which is, I, I love the work of Gerd Biester, for example, um, when he says, you know, it's a, education is, is a time and a place, space where it's, it's close to society, but it's open to the world. So he means that all the demands that society has, these this fast, very low, fast, fast, you've got to be ready for all the things that you'd be ready for and the role of education is to make you ready for all these things, mm. jobs, instrumentality, so on. And Gerbis says, no, that's not what education is for. Education is the separate space that is in a way, society can go away with all its demands just for this interval. It's also in Michael Oakeshott's um, work on the gift of an interval. Right. And it's, it's this kind of expensive gift that we give to our young people, you know, this higher education, right? Um, where they have time to think about things. And this is what I love about this book is it like makes you spend time thinking mm. and it makes you feel so happy that you took the time that you could just take your brain for a walk in any number of directions. And, you know, it's this idea, you know, this idea that the humanities enables people to have this fresh and free play of thoughts. And that society's demand for your thinking power is just mm. postponed for a moment. You're right. Where, you know, you watch your double features and your double futures. And therefore your futures get possibly double. I'm very fascinated by this idea of the double future also, because mm. I've been trying to think about what a return to the place where you started, but in a different way. Right. right. Which, he, you know, which is to do with mending, this idea of a repair as a mending and a return. So I've been kind of playing and thinking about this, which is not, you know, we are here to discuss your book, not the one I haven't written. So, you know, uh, but... That's one thing. And then the other thing I really wanted to maybe plumb a little bit more is, is how you treat emotion and, and emotion not as an individuated thing, as a individual psychology or psychopathology, but emotion as a political thing. So I'm thinking about Nussbaum's work on mm -hmm. political emotions. And she's also writ written really nicely on the use of classics in education also in cultivating humanity. And, you know, so what is that? It's about, you know, this collective ability to channel and dramaturgically process emotions yeah. in a public way. And the emotions that we are most, um, most concerned with or most immediately preoccupied with are, I would say, um, primal emotions right? These Oedipal emotions, primal emotions like lust, rage, resentment, and fear. And then in the interval, I think what we try to do is, you know, this critical, this more Marxist kind of Frankfurt school idea of, you know, uh, reflection where the emotion is, is processed and it becomes more um, subtle, more sophisticated. There's more steps to it right, more reflexive, and it gets bound up with reflexivity and the rearrangement of, mm -hmm. so this is where you get to the Spivakian idea of education as the rearrangement of desires in an uncoerced way. Mm -hmm. But you enable yeah. desires to be rearranged so that people have a, a way of asking themselves whether their desire is desirable or not. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it seems to me that the, the, that that the, I really love the section on slapstick because slapstick turns out to be such a, a, a sophisticated thing that mm. looks so silly, but it immediately um, arouses in us this reflexivity 
because already we second guess our own emotions. Right, right. Right? Because we yeah. laugh at him getting stuck in the machine, Charlie Chaplin, yeah. you know, slipping on the banana peeler, getting stuck in the, wow. the factory. And, and, but already we, we understand the inhumanity of that rhythm of speed of being forced to work instrumentally. Right. Like in, I'm thinking of that sequence well known in modern times, right? And that that is slapstick, but and slapstick kind of looks like it's just a punch on the nose and and we're just you know laughing in a vulgar, but it's not. It's this sophisticated thing. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that those were on. my thoughts. Spot on. And you know, so let me just if I could just say something about double uh, futures. And you know, um, Mark did raise the question of personhood as a certain endpoint to which one might want to orient. Uh, a conversation yeah. like this, and so that is a, a is a very serious kind of um, uh, prospect that I'm hoping this book would begin opening up. Is which endpoints might we want to think about, you know, in relation to this other this further shore that I'm. It's trying not to be prescriptive in that sense about a political project, as opposed to saying that education is about taking a walk. And it's strange. I wrote this book. I rewrote it as I was saying to you earlier under COVID conditions of hard lockdown. So, you know, I was taking myself for a walk, you know, um, from room to room and having arguments with myself in different rooms, you know, I mean, and there's a question for psychoanalysis at some point <laughs> to, to, to kind of think about. But the double future, you know, when I read it, the Ilas Modiri Molema, and, you know, he was a medical student. So there are few iconic nationalist thinkers in the first part of the 20th century. And it's strange how many of them are actually located in an industrializing South Africa in the midst of a global First World War, but also, you know, collapse of, of, uh, of um, prospects for entering industrial society. I mean, you know, the kind of emergence of a racial formation is hard in that moment. And what, you know, Charlotte Makreke, Sal Plaiki, uh, Silas Modiri Molema, Gandhi, all of these people are here in this part of the world encountering a kind of collision of, of instrumentalities and human capacities, if you like. And Molema writes as a medical doctor about science and philosophy and about time. And he reads the philosophical, the Western philosophical canon. And you know, this book is, is terribly difficult to read because it, it tries to engage the question of race as a, as a serious, you know, as a project that, you know, can still be utilized in some form or the other, can be directed elsewhere, if you like. And all he gets to at the end is an absolute sense of terror at what faces the black subject in South Africa. I mean, he's looking onto the future and he's saying, we headed for a catastrophe here. And, you know, he's trying to work out who has pronounced on that catastrophe better than you know in any of the kind of knowledge projects that we have in a better way and i mean that's why the engagement with where the science has a different concept of of time or philosophy has a different concept of time that will allow us to avert the slide into this this uh, you know this catastrophe it's the same sentiment that is produced by norbert wiener in 1950 two years after cybernetics becomes the science of the human uh, uh, the animal and machine. He writes a book called The Human Use of Human Beings, and he's saying, my goodness, automated machines are going to destroy. This is the return of the slave figure, and, and, and we've come full circle. And Lydia Liu, uh, who's written this book called The Freudian Robot, does an incredible bit of work trying to get us to think about what circular causality looked like in the moment of that, um, of that you know, uh, entrapment. Yeah, the double future is both the future that looks like the future, you know, the future that's already colonized. And if we don't, if we don't think neoliberalism has colonized the future, we're not addressing the, the problem of neoliberalism, you know. It has really captured and, you know, tried to orchestrate a desire that looks like a death, you know, the kind of hitting over the precipice. Um, but there's also the double, the future of jazz, of the cinema, of of slapstick and you know Chaplin comes after the Dada's movement which was a commentary on the kind of technological euphoria of that age you know and uh, Alfred Jarry's Ubu which was staged for one night because it offended bourgeois sensibility in Paris was actually an argument about you know what uh, 
what collision really looks like, you know, when you collide with machines. And Chaplin, I think, was deeply influenced by the Dadaist uh, movement. Um, I'm saying double futures opens up the, the door to think again. And it's that notion in Heaney of a double take in the theatrical sense, you know, where you're looking at something and you have a double take, you know, and that double take for me is potentiality. It's, it's you know, it's an opportunity for us to take something from the theater and to think about its educational uh, importance. You know, it's, it's, it's really, and in that sense, you know, the classics were, were performed, you know, in many ways, you know, Sophocles, it's staged, you know. Um, so that's the thing about the double future. Under the emotion, I, you know, I worked with Hamstring Puppet Company for many years, and a lot, much of this book is also, it parallels work I've been doing with Hamstring and a number of others in a rural community, trying to uh, open up spaces for youth mobility, because we've, you we know, we're trapping young people in the geographies of apartheid in this country, you know, years after apartheid. And I'm trying to figure out whether, you know, the, the, the kind of enchantment through the through the arts might be a way of increasing mobilities and breaking up these hardening boundaries and geographies. So Athlone was a place where people moved across racial divides, go to the cinema where they played jazz, you know, Winston Mankunku, Tony Shoulder, all of, you know, and I'm trying to get to see what that, why that has disappeared, you know, what's, what's going on with that disappearance. And Hanspring had an interesting formulation around the puppet. They called it an emotional prosthesis. And I was intrigued by that. I mean, because, you know, the puppet is anything. I mean, for me, it's just, you know, sometimes often a sign of like anxiety and terror, you know. Um, it is the uncanny in many senses, you know, as I imagine Freud's uncanny. But there is something about the puppet, uh, about breathing life into the puppet and keeping it alive, you know, on stage. And they have a wonderful description in a short production called I Love You When You're Breathing. And it's about their attachment to the puppet and keeping it alive on stage. And it brought me to this idea in Masahiro Mori, who was the great robotics scholar, who basically argued that we enter the uncanny valley when the human and the humanoid are indistinguishable. And, you know, it's the Banraku puppetry tradition that he, he kind of recuperates, you know, and says that this is the way that we hold on to something of, you know, the sensibilities of something like, you know, uh, the, the living being. Um, I just want to say that, you know, the emotion there is not simply what is given to us. And that's partly this book, you know, it takes you for a walk because in some sense it's tracking capital speculative future as it kind of, per, you know, permeates uh, the kind of the realms of empire. And at the same time, when it says, well, we don't have anything else, we have to hold on to these things and read, you know, you know, shift them in other directions, make them work towards other possibilities and other futures. And that comes from a reading of Marx's essay in the Grundrisch, in which he asks for a different attitude towards technology. And so part of the sensory training is not to surrender. And I know Ramesh Baruthram, our great physicist, is in the in the in the group. Um, is in this conversation, but not to have let the physicists determine the extent of the project of the university. Because in some sense, the sensory training is about training us to have a different attitude towards the question of technology, or to reveal something else. Um, and, and so interval for me is a space of re -entrancement. And yeah, I'm with Stiegler. I, you know, I don't think that we're going to get away. Um, you know, we think that we're going to just the kind of outcomes of this uh, headlong rush into the future. Um, you know, I think that's where the Anthropocene discourse and so on is very crucial because it's saying, watch out, yes, they, you know, they huge pitfalls along the way here, you know. Um, and once pitfalls of national consciousness is only one, you know, that we've passed through. There's several ahead of us, you know. And so I, I, I'm trying to restore something out of the, you know, what I take to be a despair. And let me just say that in that Richard Reeve novel, the tension across generations, which is the uh, also coming back to Garth's point of the different, the successive movements of students, is that it returns us to generational conflict. And what marks South Africa after 94 is actually gender and generational conflict on repeat, you know? Um, 
and, and generational conflict there in Reeves text is about Bradley's activist son in 85, saying there can be no normal education in an abnormal society. And he being completely exhausted as an activist from the 1960s, beginning to wonder whether there's any escape from, the, from this wretched script of apartheid. And you know, he has to come to terms rather than fueling that generational conflict, is to actually find a way. And you use, you know, I love the way, assuming you brought us to think about hope and its 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 difference to the idea of optimism, is to bring us towards kind of steering our way towards hope. And it is steering in that sense. And in the way that cybernetics brought us the idea of steering, you know, this is steering your way through an impasse. Wow, Pramesh, that's, I mean, it's been a fantastic conversation so far. I, I'm not supposed to do this, but I've been scrolling through the chat because um, we have unruly, unruly um, academics on, on, the, on the meeting. Um, so I'm not gonna read all the questions that are there, but there are three just, one of them was around the, the centrality of hope and how you reimagine hope. And I think you are getting that to that now. But, and, and Su Ming was also touching on this question of, of hope and how hope is not optimism. Mm. Um, so, so to put that there to you and the panel, um, there was a question or two to think more about partition in the global context. And I suppose South Africa as a metaphor for what's happening globally, um, especially in the Middle East. And then um, there's a question about music and there's so many, so many references to to timing and music in the in the conversation that's been unfolding, but but it hasn't registered as music. So asking mm. asking you know what would it look like if you did? Okay, um, those are great questions, um, and you know, and Garth also drew attention to the idea of stasis. Stasis is not simply. You know, it is an impasse, as we know. You know, but I'm I'm thinking about Nicole Leroux's reworking in the divided city of the term stasis and our kinesis is also indicated in the notion of stasis. But we're dealing with a stasis and a concept of partition that is now taking us to a space of futility. You know, I mean, there's a partition that is about an annihilation. Um, so, so I'm, you know, when Heaney is worried in the QI Troy about, you know, uh, Peace, the peace process, you know, and it's implicit in the in the text. It's a worry that you know this will only get worse. You know that is, you know. So stasis is not, you know, this notion of equilibrium that we're going to live in a world of equilibrium. You know, is actually proving to be a, a, a false promise, if you like. You know, it, because what it's doing is producing more and more nihilistic forms of 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 violence and conquest and 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 and, and power. I think that, you know, um, the way one wants to deal with hope there, you know, is not to think about it in speculative terms or, you know, as a gamble, if you like, you know, it's not, a, you know, that hope is this work of undoing that will steer us in a different direction, you know, that will begin. And education, in some sense, is not instrumental, it won't define for you where it's going to take you. But there is a way in which you know um, it it begins to open up the possibility to think about you know where one goes. Um, that's the best I'm going to be able to do on the music. I mean, I often think that I've been a very untimely thinker, um, partly because I'm mostly belated in my thoughts, you know. But um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about competing temporalities and the way the event has become the organizing formation of time in post-apartheid South Africa. So, I mean, if you look at school textbooks now, we have what Ranajit Gua once called the index view of history, is one damn thing after another. You go from event to event to event, right? There's no attempt to show that my, these might be related or, you know, there might be things happening here. So there's no interspace between one event and the other. And I've been thinking about, you know, the, about petty apartheid, which is mostly uneventful. And other than the few gallant efforts like the work done by Garth and, um, and, and other colleagues, Norman Duncan and others on the archive of the everyday, 
there's been very little to get to the project of every day. And there's some great museums. I mean, I should mention the District 6 Museum that take up this question, you know. But we're not, we're not opening this for a more substantial discussion on what it means in relation to the problem of apartheid that one inhabits. Um, so the music that, I mean, what I was trying to do in that last chapter around Abdullah Ibrahim's brother with the perfect timing and the song Mannenberg, which is a place in Athlone, it's a suburb in Athlone. And that piece of music which is composed is called Mannenberg. Um, and, you know, is often referred to as a struggle anthem of some sort or the other. And I kept asking, you know, how do people know it? Mostly instrumental, that it's a struggle anthem. I mean, there's a few, you know, it's few spoken words at the end of the 74 recording. And then it, it wasn't until I saw the Chris Austin film, Brother with the Perfect Timing, which I would encourage everyone to watch, when I realized that actually he had been thinking very carefully about timing. And so that scene that is played out where you have these two brothers ambling down the street and they're smoking a joint, which apparently I'm told slows you down. I don't know. And there's a young girl skipping by and behind her, there's a car that's accelerating, three different temporalities. And he says, so Basil Kutsia tells him the story about this, the day, a Saturday in Mannenberg. He passes the joint to his, his brother, lifts the girl out of the path of the oncoming car. The car passes, he takes the joint, puts it back in his mouth and takes a whiff. And he says, perfect timing, master musicians. And I'm curious about that setup, you know? And how one, you know, how one thinks with that setup about a place that today is only marked by discussions about gangsterism and violence. And, you know, I mean, this film is probably not even shown in schools in those, in those areas, you know. But I'm just, you know, I'm intrigued by the textures that we have available and how underutilized they are in producing a re-enchantment of the world and our concept of freedom. I must interrupt to say I loved that story, The Brother with Perfect Timing, so much. Yeah. I wanted to see it, and, and it did exactly that. It just interrupted this kind of forced temporality. It just brought you to a completely different possibility. Right. And it was just so, it was so satisfying, so perfect, just in that little moment of possibility that right. things could just really work out without very much effort somehow. Yeah, and you compare that to the temporality and the speed of the Trojan horse massacre. You know, so the, the, the temporality of the state and its orchestration of violence in that moment, and you think about the Saturday morning in Mannenberg. And so part of that chapter was to, you know, juxtapose, you know, that we're not necessarily, you know, we don't have to abide by a, techno by a temporality that is somehow about, you know, the familiar terms by which we live our, our lives, you know, that there are temporalities that we can inhabit that are, that are much looser and, you know, much more enabling, if you like, you know, um, which gets me to the, you know, the question of theatrocracy is not to romanticize the streets. I mean, you know, the debates that were, happened in those moments in 1985, when I look back on some of them, I would, I would fundamentally disagree with some of the views I, I espoused in that moment, you know, and I think we made huge mistakes, you know, um, and, and I want to grapple with those, you know, I want to, and one can only grapple with them with an educated, with an educated sensibility, through paying attention, you know, to thinking and, and working through with others, you know, a way to, to understand what was, what was unfolding. It's also another way to say that I had a misspent, a misspent youth and I spent most of it in the cinema and in <laughs> listening to jazz. So. <laughs> So Moritz, can I can, can I come in with one last uh, one last question? Yes, go for it, Carl. Thanks. Uh, so uh, Pramesh, we we won't ask you and press you on how you know that joints slow you down, but uh, <laughs> let, let's move beyond that for the for a moment. Um, and I want to pick up on this this question of the interval again, but from a slightly different a slightly different perspective. So if one thinks about the interval as, as a, a moment of pause for reflective consolidation, where you can really think deeply uh, about alternative futures, possibilities, 
temporalities, etc. I mean, one thing that, you know, that emerged from my reading of the book was that, that there's a kind of suggestion that actually in 1985, this interval, there was a loss somewhere, mm. right? Mm. And in that loss, I mean, it's, it's easy to make the kind of slippage from loss to loss of agency to complete failure. Mm. And, and I suppose, I mean, what it raised for me was a kind of question about whether th there's an analysis that's going on in the book that's suggesting that actually the kind of non-racial and anti-racist politics of the day were a failed project or whether in fact there were intervals where the promise of the interval was actually realized and translated into a moment of hope. Hmm. And I wondered, I wondered whether you could reflect on that because, because I, I mean, I think it's going to be a question that's going to be raised, you know, yeah. out of the book. Are you, yeah. are you suggesting that actually, you know, the latter half of the 20th century was a complete loss to us? Or are hmm. there moments that we can still turn to other than the 1985 moment and say, well, actually, this was an interval in which the promise of hope was actually realized to some extent or another. Because I think there's something about that historical reflection that's as important as looking towards the future, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. And I, you know, that's been the, you know, when you're writing, you realize there's something that's telling you, you're gonna get into deep trouble by saying, you know, by making this, you know, argument in this direction or the other. And I think that's a wonderful, suggestive way that you put it, you know, that, you know, Athlone is, 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 is only an, it's a name, you know, um, and, you know, I, in the text I read from Moet's essay on Freud and the psychopathologies yeah. of everyday life and where he asks, you know, what makes Vienna be Vienna, you know, the one could very well ask what makes Athlone be Athlone, you know, or any number of other, you know, it is that certain configurations of time and place kind of play out, you know, in those in that everyday structure, if you like. Um, I'm intrigued by this idea of the interval as you know, something we go in search of, you know, um, and find in it uh, a resource for, for holding on to. Uh, if not agency, at least hope, if not hope, you know, a sense of where we might want to take a kind of reading of the political in this moment. I have, you know, struggling in this country at the moment in South Africa to figure out why it is that everything that gets published now in South Africa is either a text on scandal or it's a text on, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on. And I'm not saying that, I mean, I love scandal. Um, uh, I do. But the problem here is, you know, can we find another way, another language to kind of mediate, at least generationally, a relation to this? To the space and when you go and you insist that students at a, at high school or you know universities need to engage and understand the event and understand which you know who was on the right side of history and who was on the wrong side of history and and when you pressure that i think you forgo that the the, the search and desire for enchantment in the in the generation that occupies this moment of speed and constricted space and so the interval might just be where we set to work. It's not given, it's not going to, you know, promise us, you know, it might not even promise us a lifetime of love, but it will give us a moment to, to test, you know, what an enchantment might feel like. I like your, your reading there, you know, and I think that if there's anything that the book might want to do in terms of its, its desire and its suggestion, because I'm not opposed, I mean, the fact that you know after so many years after the trojan horse massacre i've remained with this problem of the trojan horse massacre you know to the annoyance of many of my colleagues and many of my students but part of it you know was to try and find another way to talk about the act of decimation and violence that apartheid inflicted in that moment uh, in athlone so there is there is one question Pramesh, in the um in the in the uh, Q and A, well, it's more of a prompt to ask you to speak more about this um, notion of apartheid as technology. That's from mm -hmm. Adrian. Wilson. Adrian uh, Erasmus. No, uh, Lerson. Oh, okay. 
Um, look, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning a lot on Foucault's reading of the question of biopolitics and the way in which, you know, he often framed the question of technology of power as a way for us to think about a converging set of, of uh, interests and, and, and forces. Um, I'm, you know, convinced that in some sense when, so, so there, there are three particular, and you know, if I may just, uh, what do you call this, uh, a spoiler alert, um, that in, so it opens with the question of the end, abolition of slavery. And, you know, I'm, the interesting, when I came to Heaney and I saw, the note, when I read the phrase, the rhyme of hope and history, I thought about 1834 and 1994. In 1834, the abolition of slavery in the Cape Colony and the Caribbean, and 1994, the end of apartheid and the promise that we had come somehow exit, you know, the burdens and script of race that were given to us. And why should anyone in 1994 look on that as a promise, as anything, you know, worth kind of holding on to, when 200 years before that same promise was made in the set in a space close to where Mandela, Lord, you know, addressed the. The, the, the large crowds that had gathered in the archive of, of, of slave experience that lies adjacent to it. So a short way into this question is that at first moment in the lacuna between the abolition of slavery and the onset of a revolution in thermodynamics, which produces an industrial formation that is, that is unprecedented. And that brings about you know, one of the most important and substantial critiques of capital. Uh, through Marx and Engels' work in that moment, but also more generally, um, that suddenly you have a way in which technology is no longer simply means to an end. You know, it, it's, it's, there's something else that has been reconfigured in that moment. And you see it in Goethe. You know, there's in uh, Faust too, the terrifying sense of a slide into mechanized forms of life, which is what is enacted in that scene in uh, Auerbach's Tavern in Leipzig. Um, is is a is worried that you know Germany is you know, German proletariat is losing its culture, the working class is losing its culture and its cultural sensibility. Um, you fast forward to the early 1900s, the second moment in the kind of iterate, second iteration of the question of technology and race is in the Gestalt debate, and that's the moment of Kurwitz training, and that's when a topic form of race is brought under control of a discipline called psychotechnics. I argue, for example, that Verwoerd is often thought of as the architect of apartheid. In fact, he was a lab technician in a minor discipline of recent origin called psychotechnics. Um, and if you think about that, you know, the machine and its measuring capacities were put to use in dividing and figuring out emotional responses to psychic prompts work out who was psychologically vulnerable. And this is not, this is the point that there was a kind of humanism that underwrote that, that project as bizarre as it sounds, you know? And you read Erica Fredwell's book, you see that in the US, it was something that Du Bois was particularly interested in responding to, you know? And then the third iteration is the iteration of cybernetics, which is where this, this remainder at the end of slavery is deposited and comes to rest in the project of apartheid and petty apartheid. And, and so I'm arguing not simply that apartheid is linked to technology or, you know, that, but that race is a particular, has a particular relation to technology that brings about the formation of a political rationality that we call apartheid. And that might not be too far away from where the rest of the world thinks that it has already overcome this problem and that you know it is somewhere else in South Africa and far away because it might still be on the horizon and that was Derrida's point in racism's last word the last uh, about that is the what word for difference the last of many to come I, th I think Ukraine have a question he, he put his hand up, but we can't turn his mic on. So um, I've messaged him. Um, <clears throat> Pramesh, can I, ask you, can I ask you a question? Since it's, mm. it's only quarter to 10 at night here. So 
I, I, you can exercise your exercise your mind for a, for a minute or two. Um, yeah. It's something we've we've spoken about before, and this is, you know, this notion of the blunting of emotions and the scarring. So 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 the the repetition of. So so your argument in the book is that petty apartheid is like the, that's what repeats in a sense. That's the that's the repetition in the everyday that is kind of shaping existence in our present. Yeah. As a result, in a certain way, of a of a mastery of this discourse of the blunting of emotions, right? So, so which 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 puts me in mind a little bit of Amy Cazé's discourse on colonialism, where he speaks right towards the end of the mastery of this concept of man that that Europe has produced, which is America, and he says that's a barbarism that you cannot escape. At least you cannot escape it without scars. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm wondering there on the, the role of the scar, which, 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 which comes up, you know, I mean, the whole book deals with the question of the wound and can the wound be healed, can it be plastered over, et cetera. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that mm. kind of, that kind of nexus. Yes. In terms of well, it's a lovely question because it also allows me to get back to both Su Ming and Garth's earlier prompts on Ireland and agency. Um, you know, the first play that struck me as into, as fascinating when I went to spend the three months with Jane Allmay and, and colleagues in Ireland was Brian Friel's Making History. And it is the, the play that kind of tackles the question of partition and nationalism. And the problem there was that it didn't enable me to get to the problem of mastery, you see. In other words, I could have addressed the problem of the wound and, you know, and in that way, you know, gone through again, you know, uh, as many people have done, is to think with Fanon through that problem. And when I stumbled on, and I did stumble, on the Kyo et Koi and realized that it was written for Mandela, but also that Kada Asmal, who was the first minister of education in the Mandela administration, was a friend of Heaney, and they often spend long hours together talking, and had actually written some of the notes, the uh, play notes for Day Company's work, which was like the community arts project that we worked on, you know, the archive at UWC. Uh, I realized, my goodness, this play, I mean, and assuming you're right, it can be read in so many different directions. It's such an open-ended play. But what was interesting is that it correlated mastery and woundedness. The Philoctetes is, you know, got a snake bite, you know, and they try and leave him on the island because he's got a stinking wound but he has the bow that is needed for the victory over the Trojans. And Neoptolemus is brought back with Odysseus who instructs him basically to trick this uh, Philoctetes into handing over the bow with the promise of freedom. And you know, it had all the themes of Mandela coming off the island. And Hini was asked to do Antigone initially as a gift to Mandela. But he chose Sophocles' Philoctetes because it was the play about education. And I've read that play so many times now, and I keep thinking, and I got in, into lots of trouble, sometimes with uh, you know, people who are much stronger than me, about um, well, how I read that play. You know? And I'm suggesting that Neoptolemus is maybe in the moment of thinking about his, his education, he asked not to surrender either to the woundedness or to the trickery and the sophistry of someone like Odysseus. But to find another way, you know, that is not entirely, and, you know, he would lean on Philoctetes, but not necessarily, you know, uh, Edison, his entire education without giving up, you know, without holding on to something like a, like a hopeful uh, prospect. And I reckon all our students enter universities in search of some hope, you know. Um, and and, and we, we read that as giving, you know, training people to get jobs and doing this and that, and as opposed to, you know, learning to love knowledge, you know, learning to actually enjoy learning. Um, so, so in that sense, Moritz, you know, the, the, the question of the wound in, in, and mastery are played out in a very different way uh, to give us the problem of object life. Which, so I, I both share in Cezaire's kind of investments and commitment, 
But I'm also saying that out of the figure of the slave as an inaugural moment of a certain racial uh, project over in, in modernity, what one gets is a, is a way to kind of think through the question of mastery and the wound somewhat differently. So, so where one apprehends the problem of race in a circular causality, like apartheid, becomes an important question. And where one apprehends the question of race will also give you an opportunity to think about how to exit its dire and wretched script. I can tell you're not satisfied with my answer, but we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> we can leave that for over a glass of wine, as they say. Yeah. Um, of course, we don't say that. Other, other, they say that, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't see, actually see any more questions. I, I, I can turn it back to the rest of the panel. I don't know if Garth and, and Su Ming, if you have any last comments and then final words from Pramesh, I think. No, I mean, I don't. I mean, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, Pramesh has given, a, again, a fascinating set of responses here. Um, I'm sure that it's going to offer many of us food for thought. Pramesh, just again, from my side, thanks for the... Thanks for the opportunity to really just engage with this work. I think it's been a it's been a wonderful way to spend a Friday evening, um, and and really just inspired by the kind of ways in which you're extending the boundaries of our thinking around what I think is a, a real conundrum in South African society at the moment, but I suspect has much more relevance to other parts of the world. Than what we uh, th than what we anticipate right now. So really, just from my side, many many thanks. Thank you, thank you, God. And and I really appreciated the comment. I'm sorry that your Friday night was uh, you know um, I'll make it up somehow. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have any any more. You know, I I would think I will continue to enjoy this book for a long time. So that's. That's all I can say, really. I, I'm definitely going to go back and read parts of it again. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much for writing it. Thank you so much, Suming. And, 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 you know, those comments were really, you know, they were spot on, you know, um, both Garth and yours. So it gives me hope that the book can be read, um, even if it feels like being taken on a walk. As long as it's a walk and not a ride, I suppose we, you know, we're in good, we're in good, uh, in good form. Um, uh, so I also just want to, Moritz, in closing, say thank you very much. I mean, it's a, it's, it really is a treat to hear your your thoughts being read back to you. You know, um, and there's there are ways in which, you know, these connections don't always, you know, appear to one in the process of writing. They come to, you know, they come to you in a much, in other forms at a much later time. But I do want to just raise this notion of consilience, as a, you know, it's one of the arguments in the book that is not very extensively developed, you know, but I have been thinking a lot about, you know, what we do with the inheritance of the scientific revolution of the 1900s. And there's Heidi's question about how its attachment to empire uh, and to a public sphere, you know, in, in this country, a settler public sphere allowed for a mythic formation to re return to the realms of science um, and to really drive it into a devastatingly, you know, uh, uh, bizarre space. Um, so, you know, the whole thing about apartheid's political mythology, it's Africana nationalism's, re, you know, recourse to the, uh, uh, the ab abolition of slavery to tell its story about its, its foundational fiction, if you like, um, are, are really crucial. So consilience for me is something we, we, take, we can take from the sciences as a way to rethink you know, the project of the university. So the university, as I see it, has become in apartheid modality, a university of parts. And in a sense, you know, we are dealing with the question of apartheid right at the institutional site of the university. In it's very projections of knowledge and productions of, of, of ideas and, and concepts. 
And I want to ask us to think, push thought to the limit here and ask what it would mean, not simply to you know, do what everybody does. It's like, we'll bring the sciences and the humanities together, but to think, and that's the orchestration of the puppet, is that the puppet is not just a technical thing. It's enacted in all sorts of ways, and it actually holds more of the senses together than we get to admit. And in that sense, you know, I've learned a tremendous amount from a young group of puppeteers who are associated with us at the Center for Humanities Research called Ukwanda Puppetry and Design Collective. And for those of you who are in Cape Town, I'm going to use this opportunity to make a plug. They are performing uh, a production called Makreke, who was the first science student in, uh, to graduate at Wilberforce College from South Africa. It was W.A. Du Bois and uh, worked with Du Bois and a whole number of people at Wilberforce. And Tozama April, who wrote a PhD uh, on Makreke, has now been translated into a theatrical work with puppets, and it will be performed from the 7th to the 11th of February. So I'm going to use this moment for a little bit of free advertising. Those of you who want to visit us in Cape Town, please feel free to do it. Bring your own electricity, though. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Maurit. You, I think you muted. Thanks, Pramesh. The, the theater does have a generator, so if you do come, the show will go on. <laughs> ah, that's right. yeah. Okay. I think that's, I mean, that, just to say thank you to everyone, thank you to Garth and to Su Ming for taking the time and Pramesh as well, and to Letitia and also, you know, I mean, for this whole panel to be together. It's been fantastic and incredible conversations.